Hey guys, welcome to the 38th episode of The Learning Podcast. And if you aren't sure, it's a Singaporean podcast dedicated to learning something new from every single guest on this show. And today, I have a friend, Terence. Terence, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank to you for having me here, JJ. Thank you. I'll, I'll just say a little disclaimer here, right? Um, this podcast of me is in no way endorsing any political parties. And the reason why I'm saying that, right, is because Terence, right now, he is a candidate in the Progress Singapore Party. That's right. And if you aren't sure, right, right now is like the election period political rallies and all that kind of stuff. So I must say that in terms of political knowledge in the field of like Singapore, I really have no idea. And I'm just really interested to have meaningful conversations with people who are involved in it because sometimes there's only so much that you can learn from like Channel 5 or those clickbaity uh, Facebook social yeah. media articles or those right. five seconds uh, sentence which you say might be out of context, right? So 10 I things you should know about him, but no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I felt that the better a better way to really learn more and learn more about the story of you or whether it's the progress of the Singapore party, right? Is to really just sit down and have a conversation because I, I would see you again, I really have no idea about politics. Uh, and on this note, I actually have reached out to many, many political parties and just to have like any representative from their organization to have this conversation. And I'm really, really appreciative that um, Terence has taken the time because I know that this period right, is crazy. Like yeah. you're going all over yeah. the place, like you're going all over. Right? So I really, correct. Th thanks so much for really doing uh, this. No, right? no problem. I mean, if, there's something that I can share and if there's something that anybody can learn, I'm more than happy to share because you, you have to see one of the primary reasons why, I, why I'm even in this election is I really hope that uh, people can understand policy more, they can understand politics more and to know very importantly, politics affect every facet of your life. So that's, you know, people are normally apolitical. My wife is apolitical. There's nothing wrong. But if you don't see that something might be going wrong, then you can't change it. So um, to me, hand to heart, it really doesn't matter whether I win or lose. If through the efforts of me and my, my party mate, Sean, who's much younger than me, right? he's like 23, um, and, and of course across all the, all the other parties, all these young people are able to lend a voice and, 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 and through this particular general election, people can see a youth representation that there's nothing wrong with stepping out and standing up, not against, but just standing up to say something. I think if this is able to get people thinking that, hey, look, maybe it's not a, a taboo after all, you know, to, to be in politics, then I would have done uh, what I set out to achieve. I, I, I would have gotten everything that I wanted. So... That's not, okay, if it sounds like an agenda, uh, it, it might be, but that's what I really hope to mm. have. Yeah. So actually before this, right, we were having like a conversation about you personally knowing uh, Dr. Tan Chin Bong and knowing some like notable people in this field, right? Yeah, so that, that, I, that, I, I felt that the conversation we had before even the recording started was really very interesting and I'll, I'll, I'll really be appreciative if you could share like just your thoughts on it, right? A couple of contexts about Terence, right? T Terence is actually a SI pilot. He flies the Boeing 777 at the, in a Singapore airline. So it's actually, I think, one of my first few times speaking to a pilot. So I'm really very, uh, wow, you know, wow, very fascinated. Yeah, well, at least stuff. you didn't call us bus drivers, you know? <laughs> some, some, some people do that, yeah, especially if you're Airbus. So you become a bus oh, driver. Oh, yeah. but your brother? Your, I know your brother is a pilot as well, right? Yes, but he's also flying a Boeing, so. Oh, yeah. okay, it's not an Airbus, Airbus yeah, plane, right? Yeah. Um, a little more context about Terence, he actually used to run his own business in the private aviation industry. And I must say that it's like really quite a hustle because like if you are serving, if you're being like a broker in this aviation field, yeah. right, the capital that you need, right? Of course, the margins as well, I believe there will be a lot as well, but the, the guts to really go into this field. And I know you also went to the United States. I, yeah. I tried to do my homework, like all, all that kind of stuff. I, I really think it's like, I mean, not everyone has done that. So I really, I really think it's quite interesting. Terence here is also a dad. So yes. how old is your daughter? My daughter is now, I think, seven weeks. Wait, wait. Two months old. Two months exactly. old. Exactly. Hey, uh, today is what? 28th. Okay, tomorrow will be exactly two months. Mm. Yes. Con con Congratulate. What's her name? Uh, her name is Kara, Kara. with a K. Cool. Yeah, Kara with a K. Okay, so going all the way back, I just wanted to maybe lift, uh, start off for where you ended, right? I was just talking about like the day-to-day -day activity of what you're doing right now in the midst of like this period, right? Because technically you're like marketing PSP in a sense. So Definitely. maybe could you just run through or paint a picture for listeners out there, right? I mean, what's the day-to-day -day schedule of someone who is being a candidate in a political sure. party? 
Especially during a general election season like right now, uh, we'll be looking at about uh, 16 to 18 hour days. It's quite typical. Um, you, you can't escape that. Of course, on a non-election day, uh, meaning just uh, like, like last year, right, we do walk about pretty often um, and, and all the other outreach events, be it door to door or whatnot. Um, but those are maybe like, okay, once a week, once every couple of weeks, you know, but now it's literally every single day. Of course, you know, there's a lot of folks out there who say, yeah, you guys don't walk the ground. You guys don't walk every day. I mean, I, I honestly don't think that any political party can walk every day. We have all volunteers. None of us are making a single dime out of this. So we burn our weekends, our, our everything like last year and even early this year, right before the, the elections. Um, and before the lockdown, no. yes, important, <laughs> before the lockdown, the, the circuit breaker. Um, when we do all these uh, 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 walkabouts and stuff, so what will happen is I might come back from a flight and then if they have one right after, I'll straight out change my uniform, then I'll show where go. So it requires a lot of dedication, you know, not only from me uh, as a pilot, but every person from any walk of life, every walk of life, you have to sacrifice. There is nothing else. You have absolutely not, nothing to gain. So if people say, oh, you're trying to do this for, for fame or whatever, I mean, come on, seriously, you, you think anybody really wants this kind of fame? It's not even fame. You, you probably get notorious or something, you know, you get blacklisted. So our volunteers, and we have a huge group of volunteers, we have more than a thousand members in PSP. Yeah, wow, we, a we, thousand? Okay, that's a lot. Okay, like, quite, quite a bit more than a thousand, but um, we are already the largest alternative party in Singapore. Mm. Not to boast, it just so happens that, you know, that, that people join Dr. Tan Cheng Bong because of who he is. Um, but you see, we have a huge team of volunteers who really day to day, week after week, month after month, they just keep giving and giving and giving and they get nothing in return. So my head really goes off to all these people all the time. Mm. Yeah. So on that note of volunteering, right, can you maybe share listeners, like at what point did you get involved in this, like the very start? How, how do you, when, when do you even start volunteering and how did you progress to where you are right now being a candidate for the party? Uh, okay. <laughs> um, volunteering, I, okay, so I joined PSP just slightly less than a year ago. Um, it was really through Doc's press conference uh, when, you know, he was looking straight in the camera, right? And he said, I need good people to join me. And I, I don't think I'm a good person, but I think when Doc, you know, he comes up with such a heartfelt speech and I've been following him since the longest time, since 2011, when he ran for presidential election, he so narrowly lost to Tony Tan. And in 2017, there was a whole change of, you know, the constitution and stuff, which, well, I don't agree with. Yeah, but after that, I started watching a lot of his history, a lot of his videos, and I was like, man, this guy is really someone I'd like to follow. Next thing you know, a couple of years later, he started his own party. And when he looked into a camera and, and he said, I need you know, people to join me, and I'm like, I immediately, without thinking, I went to a PSP website, I signed up straight away. So that was the start of it. And after that, uh, volunteering, of course, uh, involves many different kinds, right? Walkabouts, door to door. Uh, you know, giving out flyers everywhere, uh, um, helping with maybe the comm side, the communications, uh, social media. Basically, there's a million and one things in which people can help. It's not necessarily you have to be uh, knocking on doors saying, hi, we're from PSP and da-da-da-da-da, you know. That, that's good, but if, if you are not really a front-facing person, there's uh, many, many other things in which people can volunteer for. So... My part from there to where I am today, I think it's uh, uh, well, I, I, not I, a planned one, is it? Most certainly not. You know, um, shortly after I joined PSP, um, we had an orientation class, right? So everybody, most people go through orientation classes just to get to know more about PSP, the decorum in which you're supposed to have when you're doing door-to-door -door walkabouts and stuff. Yeah, it's just, you know, an intro to the party. And during the, I was in the second orientation class. So um, we we're all asked to int introduce ourselves. And um, yeah, so I was introducing myself. Hi, my name is Terrence. I'm da -da 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 -da. Then I, I got to a point where I'm a Singapore Airlines pilot. 
and uh, right after that, the 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 person taking the the orientation class he said, okay, okay, come up, come up to the front and speak. So I was like, man, I'm not prepared for this, man. I don't know what to say. So Public speaking is another thing, right? Yeah. So I just went up and I just started talking, you know, just um. Talk- what what do you talk about? Do you remember? Talking nonsense. I, I <laughs> well, okay. I I was saying uh, that this is the first political party that I ever joined, probably the last. Um. I told them the reasons why I joined and I told them that yes, I am married. So, yeah, uh, for some reason or another, uh, somebody liked the way that I talk and then a few days later invited me to have a sit down with uh, Dr. Tan Ching Bok at his house. So I was like, man, man, things escalated fast, man. <laughs> they escalated. <laughs> yeah, so I, I went to Doc's house, uh, Doc meaning Dr. Tan Ching Bok, that's what we call him. So I went to Doc's house and... Uh, yeah, you know, uh, Doc was asking about my life, about uh, my school, and, and stuff like that, you know, just just a casual chit-chat. And at the end of it, he, he asked me, uh, do you want to consider, you know, um, stepping up, you know, for... I, I would assume he's talking about the elections. So I, I think I straight out, if I don't remember wrongly, I straight out say no. I, Can I ask at this, how, when was this exactly? Like one, eight months ago, six months ago? Was it this year or was it like uh, recent? 10, 11 months. Okay, that was quite a long ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I almost straight away said no because I I don't want to... I never joined to be a candidate. My goal is to just support Tan Chin Bong in any way that... that okay, la, any way other than as a candidate, right? So to help give out flyers and stuff. But, yeah, so that was that. And... Um, I was told to consider, oh, you know, if, if you want to help uh, maybe give campaign speeches next time at rallies, if you can consider, then I said, okay, fine, I'll consider, you know, I, I'll try to see what I can do. Then, of course, time passed. I joined in different walkabouts, th- different events here and there. And um, when elections were about to be called this year, um, I was, m- my wife was expecting so she was, uh, baby was due in 1st of May. Labor Day is Labor Day. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was the expected due date. And um, elections were expected to be called in either April or May at that point of time before the whole lockdown happened. So obviously, there's no way I'm going to do, I'm going to run. Oh, but yeah, I mean, can you share with me, like, I mean, that story, eventually you did run, right? But I'm sure that it must have been, have been like, quite a conversation with your wife and your family as well in, in, in yeah. between the tours. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, Can yeah. you just that, share with me that, that process, that, that step where you overcame from, came from no to yes? Okay, so um, Doc personally called me mm. and he said, uh, you know, if, if you can reconsider. And of course, the tremendous respect I have for, for this guy, right? He's as sincere and as real as they come. Uh, and because I really do want to help him, I, I said, okay, I'll reconsider. But uh, that was before the lockdown happened. Then after I, I told him, oh, my wife is giving birth. So after that, he said, okay, you know what? You take care of your family. Uh, you, you don't need to think about politics. So fine. Then after that, of course, uh, COVID was lifted. Uh, not, not COVID, the circuit breaker was lifted. I right? we went to phase one, phase two, and so on. So um, at that point of time, um, I was again asked, because of certain uh, uh, changes in, in the party, uh, you know, a certain number of people leaving, the, the dynamics changing and, and all, all that kind of stuff. So I was, it, I was asked to reconsider again. And then I, I talked to my wife. La, I, I asked her, um, you know, what do you think if I were to run? Then it's... It's a very common phrase I hear all the time from not only her, but my parents, my friends, my colleagues, my relatives. You know, you're, you're going to lose your job if you do this. You're, you're never going to get promoted. That was what one of my colleagues said. A lot of people have a very negative thinking that if you try to serve your country through politics and not for the PAP, you're going to get fixed by them. Because, I mean, Lee Sien Long quite publicly said that if there's, what, 15 or 20 members of parliament, uh, opposition members in, in parliament, he's going to spend all his time thinking of how to fix them. So people are, 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 are so conditioned to think that the moment you are in the other camp, you're finished, your life is finished. And especially because SIA yeah. is owned by Tamar Singh. So um, it was a very difficult 
uh, way to convince. Um, things actually changed um, after my daughter was warded. She was warded before she was even one month old. She was warded for six days. Um, it, it was uh, quite a complicated thing. She had to go through biopsy and stuff like that. But um, long story short, she was okay after that. And I was very thankful that you know everything turned out fine. And I told my wife after that, I said, I, I really think I want to, I want to run, I want to contribute. I never tell her that I feel it's my calling. Like, I think that, that sounds so airy-fairy, you know, but yeah, I, I, I told her, I think I, re I really want to do it, you know, for Doc, not for myself, for Doc, literally just for him and for country, like, for people, right? Because it has to be a very selfless thing if you really think about it. There's nothing to gain. I, I have absolutely nothing to gain. I have, uh, of course, quite a lot to lose. Uh. And after that, finally, my wife said, okay, um, we'll pray about it. You know, we're, we're, we're Christians, so we did. And as time passed by, I think slow, slowly but surely, her, her thought changed for some reason. And then after that, I talked to my siblings about it. I told them, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of... Uh, running in this GE. First thing my brother said, he's a pilot, right? He said, you're crazy. Huh? Your job how? Then I explained, I, I explained my rationale. So after that, they, they, they were quite supportive actually, which kind of surprised me, both, both my siblings and uh, my, my brother-in-law as well. So yeah, then after that, I told my wife, hey, you know, they're actually okay with it. And after that, uh, uh, but I, I didn't tell my parents, uh, so um, it was only after I already decided and I told my wife, then my wife, uh, uh, was, she was accepting. Then I told my father-in-law. And of course, the, the same thing all over again. I know your job, your this, your dad, take care of your family. But prior to this, do you know like their political preference? I know like for certain families, they're like outright this, but others outright that. Was it like more of like a quiet, quiet political uh, for my family like we are like mainly politically quiet about it we, are, we don't really yeah. talk much oh, about of, it so of course. how is the dynamics politically in, like within your yeah I'm, I am by far mm. by a very long shot the most politically active person in, in, <laughs> in both sides of the family most people are like fence sitters mm. they don't know of course we have a lot of members in our family who are very pro PAP mm. PAP all the way you know and it's very difficult to convince people about why you want to stand and stand for in, in, in the other side, right? People don't, people just can't accept that um, you can do something for nothing. Because look, we have to understand something very important is that chances of winning as an alternative party member is incredibly low, it's close to zero. You stand, most likely you're going to lose. That is a fact of the matter, much as I would like to say, yeah, fingers crossed, I have good confidence in this. When I walk the ground, every, everybody starts cheering for me. It, well, well, okay, people might be really very receptive and that is the truth when, when we walk the ground, people are very receptive. But to say that that translates to actual votes on polling day, I think we have to rethink about that because every time we see at the rallies, you know, people are so rah-rah and all, yeah, at, at the polling day, the results don't show. Right? They get decimated. Mm. So we cannot be overly optimistic and, and maybe even a bit naive, so to speak, to think that, yeah, we will we, we, we'll win this. We have to understand that we step up over here in this capacity. If we are going to lose, you gain nothing and you are just going to be ridiculed by netizens. You are, you are, you are going to be maybe judged. judged and maybe be the butt of all jokes, you know? So why put yourself through, through stuff like that? People don't see that sometimes there's something bigger than yourself. And what's that thing bigger than yourself? It's your next generation. And that, that's why I, I say a, lo a lot of things changed in my mind, especially after my, my, my daughter got warded and came out okay. Because now the focus has got to be how do I build a better society for her? How do I make sure that by the time she grows up, she can be proud to say I'm Singaporean. Just like I'm proud to say I'm Singaporean and I fly my country flag proud and high. Every single flight I go, I fly the Singapore name because we are Singapore Airlines. 
I don't say I'm an opposition guy. No, I don't identify myself as that. And I don't even like the word opposition. Yeah, for, for me, I don't like the word opposition because it naturally has like a negative connotation to it. Exactly. And I, and I, and I, and I, and I agree with you the point that it's just about doing what's the best for Singapore on exactly. a macro whole rather than like labeling people because exactly. if you see opposition is like, you're like the bad guy naturally, right? But yeah. it's just that English definition that have been fixed. Correct, correct. So, so I don't like that definition as well. Yes, I so I, I prefer to call ourselves as alternative parties. Yeah, I lo- I, yeah that's actually why I think that, that the word should be used. Not, not Because if you're constantly using oppositions, like you're drilling in that you're yes. like the bad guy. To yes, people. yes, yes. And, and people and focus on that. You see, unfortunately, over over the past couple of decades, um, people have this idea that people in opposition are just angry people who like to shout at rallies, uh, you know, do, do all kinds of weird things at a rally and then, you know. I mean, to a certain extent, I mean, you see things on like all the, all the bite-sized videos, right? I mean, there are some certain instances, like, it's just that the things we see on social media is really just like, in my opinion, it's like, like hyped up in what they want you to see. Yeah, but, sense, like. but we can do better than that. Yes. We yeah. can be better than that. We can transform. I hope from my generation, we can transform politics for good. Not to have adversarial politics in which every time you just, well, wow, anything the PAP say you, is bad. Not everything they release is bad. In fact, I'm in support of so many of their policies, but I know there are some which are bad and which they're very, very pro uh, PAP supporters. They, they refuse to see they refuse to accept that the PAP can do any wrong. But if we don't realise that we are all just human and that these people are not God, they are all here to serve, just as we are. The, if you can't see that, I feel the country cannot improve. So, fingers crossed, through this GE, through whatever work we've done, we can slowly but surely start changing the mindsets of people. And... I think if we can do that, if, if we can have the next generation of people come up, learn that uh, politics does affect them and they are able to, you know, just pay more attention to what's happening in society, to what's happening in the lower shuttle of society, whether there's any income inequality mm. and, and so many other issues, right? Be it uh, uh, the, the, the number of foreigners in the country, uh, do we have enough jobs for our own locals, you know, stuff like that. Once you really start thinking about it and you start delving dwell, into it, then you see, oh, maybe some things must change. Then if our, people of our generation can see that and, and, and they start looking, you know what, maybe the person on the other side of the fence has a point, then I would have felt that I achieved everything that I wanted here. Mm. Yeah. On the note of uh, things that can be improved in Singapore because like from my perspective right, I, I'm still very young la, so I'm warped in my own own world right, of being like career minded yeah, we just, are the same generation uh, okay. uh, yeah, yeah, actually you're, you're only a few years older than me technically but I feel like in my world I'm very warped in like the work I'm doing so if you ask me to say what things can be improved in Singapore I'll hesitate to say because I don't really even know what the problem is to see in sufficient skills so from, from your perspective um, I believe in pattern recognition. Like you are, you are on the ground. You talk yes. to people. You have been in the PSP for a while right now. Is there any? I I, I, I feel that you are in a better position. Definitely better than me, right? Well, to see what problems there are yes. can be improved in Singapore. So at least from your perspective of having volunteered in the PSP, what are the more the more of the critical things that you have pattern recognized and feel right. that it should be things that should be worked on. Yeah. Look, uh, before I was even in the PSP, I was a grassroots leader a m- number of years ago, about five, six years ago, about there. So it's it's not like the first time I'm trying to serve people, you know, su- suddenly join a party just ju- just for, you know, just for kicks. No, I, I, I have been on the ground since a number of years ago, ser- serving in some other consumer association and stuff like that. So you do see that there are certain cracks in the society. So... First and foremost, the thing I like to say is Singapore is an absolutely great country. It's superb. But it's not where I hope it can be. And whatever Lee Kuan Yew has done to put the foundation of a country that has put us in a great state for decades to come. But if there is something that can be changed, especially on the ground, right? So what we see on the ground now is there are a lot of people who who are not getting the help that they deserve. 
um, things like uh, wages, you know, some something like income inequality. This is something. Um, it's a very touchy topic because people don't like to talk about money at the top end, right? But uh, this is the problem that I see. If you ask me about income inequality, we don't have a minimum wage model. We have a progressive wage model. Does that work? I think it does. Could it be better? Most definitely, it can be better. PSP would like to improve on that, to enhance upon that. And we have a whole host of policies for that, right? Uh, we want to enhance the progressive wage model, which, okay, to, to give a bit of background, it's uh, in a, a, a set number of sectors in, of, of industries in Singapore. Um, if they are earning below a certain amount, the government will top up. That's why it's called progressive wage. So until they hit a, a certain amount, so I believe it's about 1,002 or plus minus, it's about there. So this is a co kind of the pseudo minimum wage in Singapore, but it doesn't extend across every single industry, right? That's why we don't have a minimum wage model because uh, our manpower minister says that this is a more superior model. I, I beg to disagree. I don't think there's a superior model. I, I think there's so many things in which we, we can do. In fact, what PSP would like to achieve years down the road, you know, once the COVID has stabilized, uh, once we have enhanced the progressive wage model enough, is we do hope to get into a living wage policy. So a living wage is actually something that allows people to live with dignity. You know, you you don't have to just survive on, say, a thousand, one thousand, two a month. Um, now... So if ac academics, right, if they say, okay, uh, the living wage that people should have in order to live a certain standard of living, if they put it at, say, $1,900, so then, of course, we'll try to endeavor to increase uh, that wage for everybody in all sectors to that amount at the minimum, right? So a lot of people say, oh, it's going to cause inflation, it's going to cause this, it's going to cause that. I, I don't really see it that way. Why? Because right now, Singapore is, um, okay, this might get a bit boring, but how, how it is is we are, uh, you know, pursuing GDP at all costs kind of thing, right? We, we always seek for GDP growth, GDP growth, and we don't have productivity growth. What we're having is, okay, we just keep importing more and more foreign workers, cheap foreign labor, and then they help you produce more goods and services. And through that, you have more GDP. GDP is a gross domestic product. So it's, it's the sum total of you know, all, all your uh, goods and services produced in your country in a certain year. So you bring in more people, they create more things, your GDP goes up. But where's the end? You know, 10 million, 50 million people in Singapore, there, 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 has, there has to be a, a certain number of people in which a country can take. We are such a small land, what, 715 square kilometers. You can't have 1 billion people on this island. It, it doesn't work. So what we want to see, if we increase wages and you want to keep the same standard of living without you know, hyperinflation or stuff, you have to increase productivity. To increase productivity, you probably need more automation. Uh, you, you, you need enhancements across all sectors in order to um, reduce their reliance on foreign workers. So, so that's definitely something that we would like to look at and to improve. So this is at the lower strata of society. The next one, um, at the upper strata of, so of society, right? So we look at our ministers. Their pay is packed to the top 1,000 earners in uh, Singaporeans. And they take a 40% discount for public service, right? That's what they call it. So what, 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 what public service is it? Okay, so... so Sorry, totally yeah, sure, sure. They, they say that, okay, because you are a public servant, mm -hmm. you are supposed to serve the people, you take a 40% discount of the, 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 the median income of these top 1,000 earners. Mm -hmm. But we have to understand something. People like the Haiti Lao boss who was given Singapore citizenship, people like Eduardo Severin, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Co-founder of Facebook, mm -hmm. who... Was, yes, he's based in Singapore, right? He's given a Singapore oh, citizenship. Yeah, yeah. So guys like that, right? When they become Singapore citizens, um, naturally, if they are earning a lot of money, uh, what, what happens is, you know, the, the average income increases. So naturally, your top 1,000, the median will increase. And then your minister pay, they will say, must increase because based on this formula, this model, 
your ministers must be paid more because you keep bringing all these billionaires and stuff. So, you know, now your ministers now, instead of Lee Hsien Long getting paid 2.2 a year, 2.2 million, now he must, be, he must be paid 4 or 5 million. But what about people on the lower end? So I really do hope, and this is also the party's stance, is that we can peg it to the median wage of Singaporeans, of all Singaporeans, instead of just the, the, the top end society. So what it means is, for example, now if median wage is 4,006, for example, we're not proposing that ministers earn 4,006. That is not what we mean. You earn a multiple of that, be it five times, six times, 10 times, whatever. You know, we, we, we can come to a certain conclusion after some debate. But if you base ministerial salaries based on um, median income, your ministers, our ministers rather, they would be so in incentivized to increase the wages of all in society. Because why? The more your people earn, the more you earn. Instead of now, the easy way out, okay, let's just bring in 500 billionaires. Okay, la, there are not that many, la, obviously, but it's just an arbitrary number. Let's bring in you know, a certain number of people, give them citizenship, and then, ooh, great, now we are a rich society, we have high GDP, we have this, we have that. No, man, you must always progress together. We must always lift up. This is a boat. Eh? Everybody, hopefully, is on the same boat and not on, 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 on different boats. And one is in a, a, a luxury yacht, the other one is a sampan, the other one is sinking on, on a little float, you know? No, when we lift up people, we lift up everybody together. So that's the society that I want to see, that I'm trying to... Um, you know, propose for Singapore. And see, in PSP, we, we're not looking to create a socialist state, uh, a, a capitalist state. No, what we stand for is a compassionate state. So, you know, like in, in the US, they always say, oh, you're either Republican or a Democrat, right? You're, you're the red or the blue, the left or the right. I, I, I don't think that we should use that as a metric for society. We should say, okay, Let's just help everybody. But we must never forget that we must have economic progress because you can't only keep giving handouts to, to the poor and forget that you need to advance your economy. No, so you have to do it both ways. You have to uh, have good policies to um, increase your GDP, to, to uh, boost your economy, to have uh, an innovative society, you know, to, to create companies that go really truly regional and global multinational and and these enable your our own people to go out and get great jobs be experts in other countries um earn good money and of course this in in return really grows our economy so that's on one aspect but you must never forget that there's these people who you must take care of don't say that social service is going to take care of them. Don't, don't say that, oh, uh, yeah, charity will, uh, you know, will help them. If we always rely on that, then you are bound to see people who fall through our cracks because it's very obvious when we do walkabouts, when we do door-to-door -door visits, there are always people who just don't get the help that they deserve. So, fingers crossed, uh, PSP does well enough in this GE, we can start getting a foothold in Parliament, we can start proposing our ideas and slowly but surely over a, a number of years, things start to change and, you know, hopefully by the time my daughter is my age, we would have been able to achieve all of that already. Yeah. So that, that's why I'm here. Yeah. I mean, when it comes to all these policies, I'm sure there's really a lot of rigorous debates on the really making sure what is the best for Singaporeans and I think that's really what matters the most. Yeah, look, when it comes to policy, a lot of people don't like to listen to policy. Why? It's very dry. It's very boring. Yeah, it's it dry. is incredibly boring, especially when, when whatever I say, you know, it's very, very boring. Nobody wants to listen. But I feel like it's a, it's a necessary context and it's also an important part, right? Yeah, so a lot of people say, oh, why don't we just propose this one policy, this, that policy? Okay, first and foremost, it's boring. And secondly, there is no perfect policy. You can never have a policy that makes everybody happy. It's not going to happen. There's no silver bullet. But what you have to have is enough debate about it for people to see, okay, these are the pros and cons, these are the pros and cons. Let's join our ideas, try to come to a suitable compromise, and this is what we're going to roll out. 
and hopefully you are able to see different points of view because no one party has all the monopoly of ideas. It doesn't have, it, 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 things just don't work that way. You allow the best idea to win and exactly. not who the idea is from. Yes, mm. certainly. So yeah, this is the role of alternative parties in, in Singapore mm. yeah, that I, I really believe. Yeah. On, on, on moving on to the next topic, right? Because yeah. previously, uh, we actually talked about your encounter with uh, Tan Cheng Bok and, and, yes. and, and Lee Sen Yang as yes. well, right? So from my perspective, because I'm in, like, in the marketing field, right? So I mostly like work with influencer, celebrity, like mini celebrities in that sense. Yeah. So yeah. Um, one thing that often happens is that like the persona that influencers- Larger online, than life, is it? Yeah, yeah. Like they put online and offline like, are entirely different, right? So because I'm, I'm really very interested to know, at least from your perspective, perspective of having personally interacted with these people, right? How different are they online and offline? Or is there any big, irregularities that you see like how how has interacting directly with uh, Dr. Tan uh, been like and of course right. more no notable figures like uh, Lee Sen Yang sure okay so Tan Cheng Bok is exactly the same he is uh, what you see on camera and off camera he is very sincere he is very genuine and you you don't even need 10 minutes with him to know he is the real deal people people think that oh, he's doing this just to get back at them for the presidential election. You've got to be kidding. He, 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 he can just so easily retire. Mm, he, he has a lifetime of success. He's eight years old now. Oh, that's quite old. Yeah, he's like he, old enough to be my grandfather. You know, if my grandfather started young. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah he, he doesn't need, need to do this. He does this because he sees something wrong and he feels that it must be put right with the remaining years that he have, and I, I would say you only need one minute with him face to face. One minute. <laughs> That's all. He's he's as real as they come. Mm. Whatever he says on TV and what you can feel when you speak to him directly, the vibe is identical. He is he is passionate for Singapore. Lee Hsien Yang. A lot of people don't know him obviously because he's not a public figure. Mm. I mean, he's known as the son of Lee Kuan Yew, the brother of Lee Hsien Long. Um, people know him like okay Singtel CEO FNN you know Fra uh, Frazier and Eve and then after that becoming the CES chairman mm. that's his public persona right that, uh, okay and Brigadier General as well wow. <laughs> yeah so, so this is the the impression people have okay he's a uh, son of Lee Kuan Yew but people don't know him as a person of course those who serve under him those in the army they'll, they'll, they'll know and my encounter with him is quite similar to what people in the army would say about him, but whatever I've read, right? He is a leader amongst men. He is a true blue leader. He, first time I ever met him at the uh, Tiong Bahru market for the walkabout, right? Uh, That's a number of days ago. Came out of the car, it was pouring, it was raining. We went there with umbrellas to, to, to bring him in. La. He didn't want an umbrella, he just walked. You know, he didn't need people to, to do stuff for him. Second encounter I had uh, you know, just yesterday when we did a, a walkabout at Holland Village. Um, obviously, he's larger than life persona. You know, when he walked in, in, in the market itself, in the, in the food center, sorry, people just swarmed to him. You know, it's like, oh, da, 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 da. Yeah, but that is what you see in public, right? But when we went for the door-to-door, uh, -door. this is when you see a person's real character. Why? Because you cannot, you can fake a, one person, you cannot fake the whole world. First thing, when we arrived at the uh, foot of the, 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 the void deck, because each lift can only take four people, right, social distancing, um, and there were many reporters who are with us, dozens of them. So, um, our group is huge. It's a huge entourage, right? With members, myself, some, some, some other guys and the media. So Lee Sien Yang said, you know what, I'm, I'm not taking a lift, I'll just walk the stairs. All the way up to the 12th story, non-stop, just, just walk. Because we're intending to, from there, walk, take the stairs down, lah, you know? So you walk up first, sweat it out, and after that, you slowly walk down while you cover the houses. So this guy, he, you wouldn't imagine someone of his standing, you know, as someone who has almost everything, right? Really very willing to walk the ground. We go house to house. He is 
he has no airs about him. Okay, so so one thing I I realized when uh, you know we are doing a media interview, right? They were first interviewing Xian Yang, then in interviewing uh, uh, Michael Chua, which is uh, uh, one of our Tanjong Paga GRC mates, and and myself because I was there. So so when the reporter was asking the question, uh, asking me questions, then about Mr. Lee. So I, I just kept saying, oh, Mr. Lee, you know, uh, and, and Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee, Mr. Lee. So I, I, I just kept calling him Mr. Lee. Then after the interview, he said, eh, don't, please don't call me Mr. Lee. It makes me feel very awkward. Just use my first name. So really, when we go house to house in, in this rental block, I introduce uh, myself and him. I, I'll just say, hi, I'm Terence, and this is Xian Yang. And he, he really prefers it that way. He, you see the way he connects with people, the way he talks with you know, people of, of all walks of life, right? He really has the heart and you can tell because some things you cannot fake. You can tell when someone is, is um, a little bit snobbish to people when, when they talk, like, like they have certain airs. This guy has none, man. Xian Yang is really respect, real deal. Yeah, so there's... I, I, I hope people can see that about him, but they'll never come across this person or him. They'll never see it because the, the media can never portray all of this, you see. If you're not there walking with him, working with him, sweating with him, you, you can't tell. You can't tell because the, the, the media will always portray, right? They'll, they'll cut out certain parts and then they'll just always capture what he says on TV. They, they, you, you don't capture the, the uh, minutiae of, of stuff. Um, his eyes when he talked to people, you don't capture all these things. So it's hard to tell, but I, I think I have the fortune to be able to see all this. And I think guys like him, guys like Dr. Tan Ching Bok, um, and of course some other influential leaders out there, if you work with them, you know that these are people, if they say, let's go, pack up and you go. If they say, you run, okay, I run. Of course, there's a lot of Concerns also, but you know, you you know that if this guy wants you to do it, he has a reason. He wants um he he knows why he wants you to run. And if he uh, uh, actually tells you, I need your help, I need this, I I need that. I think because of the amount of uh respect that they command, people will just say, Okay, I will I'll run for you, I'll do it for you. So yeah, it's a um, very refreshing thing to see compared to sometimes, you know, in NS, you, you, you see some something different, you know, where people play rank and stuff, yeah. So uh, I'm just curious, like, on, on your whole journey, right, like, over the past few months, I'm sure that it really has been crazy, right? I mean, on, on, hinds on hindsight, right, if you were to tell yourself, let's say, just a few tangible tips, right, five months ago, right, before everything started, right, um, is there really a, did you anticipate that this would, be how like it would be this hectic or it was something that you expected did, did anything surprise you, mean, you along the way you mean like like, journey? like me running yeah I, I, I would not thought I even want to run I'm, I'm not I'm not that guy I don't I don't play okay I, I'm no politician right I don't play classroom politics I don't play office politics I, I just live my own life like you know like um, like I <sighs> It's not right to have to backstep somebody or, or, or to use somebody to get to, to where you are. And unfortunately, politics is quite dirty. Um, it doesn't matter which party you are in. You can be in PAP, PSP, SDP, wherever. You will always find people like that. You can be in any company. You'll also see people like Private that. Private sector is everywhere, la, basically. Yeah. So if politics is like that, then I am no politician. But... If, you know, you have to have the conviction. You have to have to have the conviction to want to serve, to say that if this is what's required in order to bring Singapore to a certain level that you want to see, then you have to be willing to make the sacrifice. You, you, you can't always say, the other guy will do it, this guy will do it, that, that, that girl will do it. I tell you, the longer you, the more you keep saying things like that, that people will do things, you'll never see it. Because sometimes, sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes, that person is meant to be you. And you wouldn't know it. 
until someone points it out to you and to say that, you know what, maybe you are meant to do this. And then after you start thinking about it, then certain things happen in your life. Then you realize, you know what, this could be a calling. This could be what I'm asked to do. Maybe not permanently, but at this point of time in life, this could be what you are actually meant to do. So, like my business, um, when I when I started it, I, I was about 22 when I, 23, 23 when I first started it. People said, I'm mad, I'm, I'm crazy. I, obviously, I'm not rich, right? I don't have that kind of money to start a business. All the money I have is whatever I say from NS and my insurance job before, before I started my business, which is, which is not a hell of a lot of money. So people are saying, oh, you know, you're going to fly to the US on, on your own, start this and that. You're mad. But the difference is, if you feel convicted that, you know what, this is the path I want to take. I want to work in the aviation industry. So at that point of time, as I wasn't hiring, obviously, the, uh, after the financial crisis, um, you know, the, the airline had a hiring freeze for quite many years. So I couldn't join any airline. I, I couldn't go anywhere. So I thought, you know what, if I want a job in SIA so bad, I better uh, be in the aviation industry as early as I can. So with nothing else to go to, I, I thought, okay, I'm just going to try something. I'm gonna, just going to try it myself. So, For listeners out there, could you just like share a little bit more? Because uh, I've, 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 I've uh, read and uh, watched some of your podcasts. Uh, I think uh, on a side note, I think it's very interesting like that PSV, like on what, what you guys are doing on YouTube, I think it's quite interesting. Like just uh, to have informal conversations. Oh, because, with Craig, is it? Yeah, yeah because uh. like, what I, like what I said earlier is I like, you can't really have these kind of conversations in like media, social media. Yeah, 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 yeah. So yeah. I think it's quite interesting. That's why I got more content from you because there's only so much I could learn about you through all those uh, articles on newspaper. Uh, but on the point, could you paint a picture of like to listeners, what was this business about in terms of bro- like being a brokerage business of app air- parts or airplanes? Uh, no, no. So um, I was uh, essentially an aircraft and charter broker. Um, what it is is... Um, uh, the easiest way to explain is we sell private jets. We sell aircraft. Uh, people... To very rich people. Uh, companies. Oh, the companies. Yeah. Companies I, that require a lot of travel. Uh, I, I don't deal with uh, individuals because okay. I don't have the kind of network. So, oh, so, yes. so we deal with uh, large companies, with uh, you know those multi-million dollar companies. Um, people at the start they always ask me oh uh, when i say oh i'm selling aircraft oh what kind of aircraft remote control uh, uh toy planes no <laughs> no, 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 no i'm I'm, what? I'm 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 actually selling a real aircraft then they're like oh what in the world man because you don't meet many people like that in singapore yeah. right there's probably only a handful of us in in the country who 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 does aircraft sales and and brokerage so um and somehow i'm like literally the youngest person in singapore who would do this okay how it started, it, it really was kind of a fluke. Like. I was just thinking what to do. I, I don't know what to do. Then I started reading some aircraft magazines, right? Because I, I, I like to read those kind of things. Then I saw, okay, okay, there, there's this certain kind of, ooh, ooh, there's none of it in Singapore. Let me try my luck. I, I try to sell something here. So think of it as um, uh, selling a property, right? It's, it's about the same price as a, uh, maybe a landed house or, or, or something or a bungalow. Uh, although of course I don't have that kind of financial capability to buy one la, but there are people around who can afford so just think of it as okay buying a house so now if you want to buy a house who do you go to you go to an agent so if you want to buy a plane who do you go to you go to me okay, okay but, not but that, the right? difference here is the difference here is because I'm not well known right I'm only 23 24 years yeah, old you have the connection like that, like yeah um, so you see, when you're so young, nobody approaches you. So you got to approach people. So mm-hmm. when I first started, I tried you know, calling this, you know, da, 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 like, da, you know? like HR big companies. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, yeah, how, yeah. Do you even, how do you even call go like, do you need a plane? Like, uh, no, 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 no. So uh, we, we, we had some sort of a business plan. La. We, we, we were trying to, to deal with mining companies. Mining companies specifically. Yeah. Okay, like, that's a targeted yeah. niche. That, that was how we started. Oh. Uh, of course, unfortunately, there was no no demand for our services in, in this part of the world, right? We tried regionally, Singapore, Malaysia, Indonesia. At the start, I was running alone. I was just uh, trying to reach out to all these people. Then after I brought in a partner and then it, it, it didn't work out. So we brought in, uh, we hired a staff 
right? And then of course, the company gradually grew bigger. But essentially, we realized that something didn't work. Then we pivoted and we actually went to the Middle East. Oh. Yeah. So so that was how our business started changing, and and we started focusing more on a a, a different segment of uh, private aviation over there because obviously there are slightly uh more affluent, more uh, slightly richer companies there in which we can. So at this point, you're still targeting companies and not people, la? Yes. Okay. Because uh, it's very difficult to get individuals individuals to buy aircraft from you. you see, most of these rich guys, if they want to buy a jet. Uh, they, they might they'll probably buy brand new um, because of the face right if, if you want to buy a plane most and, and like a car most people want to buy it brand new especially if you are a billionaire oh yes yes, yes. so um, and it's very hard to reach out to them right because you need a very 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 strong network which I didn't have I started by co email co calling then slowly you build from there you know you, you meet a few good people who are willing to help you and you start building layer upon layer upon layer and and, and like my business right I, I hired staff we started expanding uh, go, going to the Middle East to, to work to to do business and it was from there that uh, we we really found out uh, we, we found our niche in the market so we were working with uh, different aircraft management companies hospitals and stuff like that be it for uh, aircraft sales or brokerage. And yeah, we, 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 we are not filthy rich or anything because we're still a small outfit. But we're able to survive for uh, an amount of time until um, there came a point in time that was in 2015. Um, SIA just opened their, 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 their um, pilot recruitment after a hiatus of, I think, for three and a half years. So, and I was running my business at a point of time close to two years already mm-hmm. since the time I started. So, uh, my business at a point of time, it needed a cash infusion um, because, you know, everything about business is about cash flow. It's always cash flow, cash flow, cash flow. So, I could either continue my business and put more money in or I could just say, you know what, I want to pursue my dream. My dream is always to be an SI pilot. So, should I go for it? So anyway, I, I try lah, I try my luck. Mm-hmm. Just so happened, I, I did manage to make it in. Uh, I, I was the first batch of pilots, uh, I was the first batch of pilots to be recruited. And you know, the rest is history. So before I joined, I, I uh, shut down, I stopped business lah, basically. And um, yeah, so that was kind of the history behind it. And I would, like to think that you must never give up on your eventual goal. My eventual goal was to be a Singapore Airlines pilot, right? I wanted that since I was a toddler. And you, you, you never give it up. You have the conviction that, you know what, if this is my end goal, what must I do to get there? So, like I said just now, I felt, okay, the way I had to do it is to already start work in the aviation industry rather than I go out and, you know, do, 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 what, what, do whatever else may or may not help you in your eventual job application. Just so happened, everything, the, the timing is just right. I didn't want to put in more, more money in the business if I can get a job here. So just so happened, they opened, I got in. So bye, 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 my company. And then that's it. Can, can I ask in terms of linking your business experience, right, to let's say your time at the PSP, it did, I, I know it's like a far-fetched like, argument, but is there any lessons along the way or values or principles that you have ingrained during your time doing your own business into how you see approaching politics? Well, you don't need to listen to people if they tell you you're mad, la, you know, because... Uh, on that note, right, like you don't... Can I ask, right, because I, honestly, I'm still very fascinated by the fact that you're able to like essentially, long story short, not give a shit about what other people think and just do what you really want in the sense whereby you really wanted to be in this political movement in that sense. No, I, I, I feel I'm a bit too strong-headed uh, sometimes. I, I think that, okay, if I want this, I must do it. And if I want to help this person, I must help this person. Um, if I want to help my country similarly, I must do it. And of course, now it's not so much for, for, for country, for people. That's, that's important. But I want to ensure that my daughter has um, 
a very good society to inherit. And you see, if years down the road, assuming I never get elected, ever, right? Uh, I, 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 I might not even be in politics for, for, for forever, right? I, I mean, no, no one ever knows. But if I can tell her that, look, daddy has done his part, right? Right. <laughs> Nobody ever can say that. When, when, when she grows older, I can tell her, daddy has tried to change this country. Unfortunately, people refuse or whatever. Um, but it's the effort that counts. Like, I really respect the effort that, that, you, that, that people... I mean, because honestly, like, I, I'm not sure what you think of social media comments, right? Like, because I have been involved in the social media world. I, so. I never read overly oh, much. I, 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 only because, I, like, I don't have too much time. Oh, okay, okay, I understand that. Oh, that may be a good thing, but like, in my world, like, you need to read through the comments, right? And you see a lot of really nasty, nasty sh- things that people say about you. And it's even more toxic in like, the political uh, comment section. Yeah. Right? There's so many people saying like, this kind of stuff, that kind of stuff. And like, in a sense, I would say like, keyboard warriors, in a sense, whereby they don't take the action. So, I feel that, not many people dare to take the action. Because, you see, my, my life has been, um, structured by, a whole series of failures. Right? Um, what do you mean? I, I don't, I, for my outside perspective, I don't see oh, it as a failure at all. Okay, right? look, um, in primary school, uh, my, my cousins, my brother, okay, my, my extended family, they happen to be incredibly smart people. They, they only went to two types of schools. One is RI or Hua Chong. <laughs> oh, okay. Chinese high. Only two schools. Okay. I, I didn't make it there. Mm. Right? I, I made it into, in, in, well, I, I think it's a good school, but no one S- else felt. SGI is a good right? school. No one else thought it was okay. a good school. I, I, I was branded as, you know, not the very smart one. Mm. Um, of course, when it came to my sister and whatnot, you know, uh, well, <laughs> she, she, she didn't do overly well. Yeah. But, <laughs> okay. but, but there's already a, a precedent set that, okay, the older brother, Terrence, has, you know, uh, uh, right, not... Not, not as smart as the rest. La. So obviously, the same goes for my O-levels, my A-levels. Right? My, my surname is Soon. La. So in the entire Soon family, to not have made it in either an Ivy League, you know, uh, 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 those top schools overseas, or a local U. I'm, I'm literally the only one. Everyone else could do it but me. So my life has been set by this. Even when I joined the youth flying club at the age of 17, I, I got chopped after my first solo flight. I couldn't continue because they said, uh, you, you know, you should try again next time. So, you know, even flying at 17, I, I, I couldn't be good enough to complete the program. Uh, of course, fortunately, I, I did complete the SI program. But, you know, it has been, been a whole series of things which didn't do well. My A-levels, I, I, I did like, like crap. La. You know, I had to retake it. So if you see that, okay, I just keep failing and failing, compared to what is expected of you, of course, people might say, oh, well, Laoi, you, you, can, you already got this, you already got that. Yeah, la, but if, if I'm comparing with my own extended family, I, I, I do feel like I haven't achieved what I wanted to. So you see, when, when you're so used to failure, right, so to speak, you're, you're numb to it. So when I started, when I wanted to start a, a business, is that I'm, I'm perfectly willing to fail. I told, I told my mom, you give me one year from the time I graduated. I said, if within one year I, I cannot do it, I will stop. Mm. So it's kind of an ultimatum. Like. <laughs> so yeah, I, um, after the one year is up, uh, well, we, 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 we continue on for one more because uh, we were still alive, uh, not bankrupt yet. <laughs> um, of course, until SI opened, then, you know, the, 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 the rest was history. La. But now the same goes is that I'm in politics now. It really doesn't matter if I fail because I failed so many times in life. I can fail. I can afford to fail again. Why? Because the most important thing is I feel I've done it before. I, I, I feel that I tried to follow my heart, follow my convictions, and the rest is secondary. So, yeah la, if, if there's a message I can bring to people, it really is. There's nothing wrong in failing. You can fail and fail and fail. I assure you, people can laugh at you. They cannot laugh at you forever. 
because your de- determination will get you somewhere at the end of the day. You know, there's this uh, saying, uh, okay, it used to be from my, from my church, uh, not, not to mix religion and politics or whatever, but it's, it's a secular saying also. Your attitude determines your altitude in life. So if you cannot give up, if you never give up, you cannot fail. People might say you're a failure, you might call yourself a failure, but you hang in there, you will make it someday. Yeah, so there's the whole moral of the story. <laughs> You know. On that note, right, uh, just to wrap up the podcast, I really want to thank sure. you for taking the time. I think this really has given a lot of breath in your experience as well. Right? On the note of advice, right, I usually like to end off with just a, some few short five questions, right? In terms of the best advice you have ever received. I know you talked about not being afraid of failure. Anything, okay. Is there any other best advice that sure. you feel that you've gotten that is worth sharing? That I remember to this day? Sure. When I was in JC, I, I was in Catholic Junior College. Um, our principal at that point of time was Brother Paul Rogers. I, I don't think he'll even remember saying this kind did this phrase, but uh, I, I don't know, is it because there was some uh, incident or school bullying or something? I, I really can't remember, but he was saying during school assembly, he said, let me tell all of you, a person's courage is inversely proportional to his height. So it, <laughs> I agree. You know, I, I'm obviously not very tall. So yeah, I, I completely agree. <laughs> you know, the shorter you are, the more courageous you are. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But okay, okay la, that, that's, that's not a good advice to tell people, obviously, because if they are tall, you can still be courageous. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it's just, it's just something that always stuck with me. You know? What's the worst advice have you ever received? Nothing much, really. I, 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 don't, I don't think that... Um, I regret many things in life because I, I, I do learn from all these, uh, uh, whatever obstacles there is. Um, but if there's something that I, I think uh, an advice given is don't try to follow societal norms too much. If people tell you you should go JC route instead of a poly route, and that, that was what I was told, right? Don't go poly because it's, it's not as good. Mm-hmm. That's completely false. Mm-hmm. If you like a course in poly, and you feel that uh, you really want to pursue that, please pursue that. Don't, don't go to a JC just because people think it's more prestigious. There's nothing. You can't eat prestige. You can't eat grades. But you can survive based on what you like. You can find a good job. You find a job that you love. Uh, you know the saying, like, you find a job you love, you never have to work a day in your life. You know, st- stuff like that. So yeah, don't, don't, don't try to conform to society so much that you end up following um, the train and you, you miss the, 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 the most important part of life. Mm. Yeah, so. I really think that this is the a topic for a whole podcast altogether like, because at least from my perspective, I mean, I was given advice to go to JC route as well, but not, not to compare myself with others, but like on hindsight, like going to J, I, I didn't really feel that it was for me, but okay, that's another story, right? One year from now, um, what tangible events do you want to happen to you that will make it the best year for your life? Celebrating my daughter's one year birthday, I would suppose. Mm. Look, family is everything. I, I, I would have to reiterate this again. I do this for, for the future of my child. Um, and of course, for my family as well, right? Um, you, you always build up your family. There's, there's this other saying, uh, 如果你顾不了自己的家，你怎么顾得了整个国家？If you can't, if you can't take care of your family, you cannot take care of your country. So always take care of your family first. So one year later, I definitely hope my 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 daughter is well. She's happy, um, and that's a good milestone to have. Yeah. So. Fingers crossed, all good. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay, Terence, thanks so much for coming on this podcast. Thanks, I really JJ. appreciate it. Right? If there's anyone who's interested in reaching out to you, I know you're definitely a difficult person to reach during this period, but if so, like, how can they reach out to you if, like, if, they, if, if they have any questions or follow-ups accordingly? Uh, well, I do have a public Facebook page, although, and, and I try to respond to it as much as I can. Uh, so far, I've been like, responding about 90%, more than 90% of messages. However, because now everything is ramped up so much, uh, unfortunately, some of my admins would have to do it. But if there's something you really want to 
uh, you know, get through to me, you can just still drop me a, 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 a Facebook message on uh, my public Facebook page. It's Terence Soon and the three Chinese words behind my Chinese name are Soon Junwei. So my admin so let me know and I'll respond to you. Got it. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, I'll be leaving everything in the video description below. Sure and thing. I wish you all the best in this Thank election. you very much, JJ. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you.